So I'm Tara, Tara Tan, and this is Danny Litzer from IDEO Colab, um, IDEO Colab Ventures to be specific. Um, who's here familiar with IDEO in general? Oh, wow. Great, awesome okay, IDEO fans. Let's get that first back there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just a quick context, IDEO is a global design studio. It's been around for about 40 years. Um, and it's done you know, sort of really great work in the world of human-centered design. It really has a focus on sort of user-centric design and designing for the users. Um, Ideal Colab Ventures was spun out about a year and a half ago, or maybe two years ago. Um, Dan and I have been at Colab for about four years and then four and a half years now. Um, and Ideal Colab is really uh, a studio that was focused on blockchain and the distributed web. And Ideal Colab Ventures is Ideal's debut fund, early stage venture fund that's focused on this space as well. So I guess today we're going to talk about designing for dApps. Um, um, do you want to give a quick, quick background for yourself? Yeah, maybe we can do that. Uh, so I'm Tara. I've had a background in product and design in emerging tech, uh, you know, for the, the last, you know, 15 years of my career. Um, I've been following the Bitcoin space since 2010, but really jumped in pretty deeply in designing for the space with IDEO about four, four years ago. Um, and since then, we've worked with a whole slew of um, awesome uh, crypto companies in the space, including helping Augur build out and ship their first um, dApp. That was, I want to say, th three years ago now. Oh, time flies. I don't know. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, but since then, you know, we've been huge advocates of uh, bringing great design to the blockchain space, mostly to bring on more users. And we'll, we'll share more why. But Dan, do you want to give a quick intro? Sure. Um, so I'm like the non-designer designer at IDEO. Um, a yeah. designer. I'm a business designer at IDEO. Um, so my background was more in like finance, accounting, operations. Um, and then I was working in microfinance. I fell down the Bitcoin rabbit hole um, as I was heading to MIT for grad school. I started the MIT Bitcoin Club. And then when this team at IDEO was getting formed, they wanted somebody who knew something about blockchains. And that's how I ended up at IDEO. So like my design education has been like, like really diving in deep with IDEO. Um, but uh, it's one of the reasons why I came there was seeing even back in like 2014, 2015, seeing how far the space still had to go. And I think we, we haven't unfortunately moved that far past there in terms of UX, um, but we're starting to make traction. There's starting to be some technical developments that are enabling it. And then I think also I brought a recognition in the space that if we keep serving the same few hundred thousand or few million users, um, none of us are really here for that. We're, we're here to make this whole movement go global. Great. So today we're gonna you know, just share a few um, sort of US bex UX best practices um, in designing for dApps, and then Dan will jump into a special segment called Magic Moments. Um, so we'll just jump in there. But before we talk about blockchain, I want it to reverse to 200 years ago um, to a technology that kind of emerged uh, around then. So con contrary to what we think, um, the bicycle was actually not born overnight from the mind of a single inventor, but rather it was an open source project that, that took about you know, 60 to 80 years uh, to come into fruition. Um, so over that time, I think, you know, the, sorry, could you hear me? Oh, right, so here, that's better, sounds good. Um, so the very, very first prototype for the bicycle was actually started in 1817 and it was called the Hobby Horse. And it didn't ha even have paddles then. Um, and what you did was that you used your two legs to kind of stride and move forward on your bicycle, and that was called the, the very, very first prototype. You know, over the next 60 to 80 years, we had various uh, prototypes from, you know, uh, moving the pedals from the front to the back. We made the wheels bigger and then smaller. But this was the work over, you know, uh, decades. Um, and it was sort of revved upon by different engineers, designers, um, product people um, over time. It was only around 1888, and this was, you know, about 70 years after the first prototype that we got to the, the form that we recognize pretty much today that still, you know, endures, you know, 200 years later. The bicycle even had its own hype cycle. These are actual quotes from the Washington Post and the New York Post from its time. In 1890, the papers procla proclaimed that this was a passing fad for music hall types, AKA hipsters, as we know them today. <laughs> in 1896, it got to a huge fever and people were saying that bicycling is the next national sport before 
uh, dipping down in 1902 and saying that the popularity of the wheel is doomed. In 1906, that cycling is definitely dead. You know, as we know today, over time, that this just wasn't true, the bicycle ended up not being just a passing fad. Over time, bikes got better, infrastructure right, like roads got a lot sturdier, and you know, we used bicycles for a for multi multitude of uses that we couldn't even imagine back in the 1800s. We have um, messenger bikes, we have bikes that go on roads, in the cities, we have bikes that go, you know, in mountains and dirt roads. It just served a whole platitude of user, uh, use cases that we didn't imagine uh, back when the bicycle was first prototyped. So I guess you can see parallels to where we are uh, in this space. You know, hopefully it won't take 80 years. Hopefully we'll be within our lifetimes. Uh, but where are we exactly in the evolution of the decentralized web? Are we here? Who thinks we're here today? Kind of awkward, <laughs> maybe kind of moving, crouching a little forward, a few hands. <laughs> Are we closer to here? Yeah. Sentiment? No? A few shaking heads. You know, are we kind of aiming for this, right, for the future? I love this. I, I, I hate carrying bikes um, up staircases. I mean, if we look at sort of user adoption, on the decentralized web today. I mean, there are a ton of metrics that people have looked at. Even these are not super comprehensive. Um, but you know, you can look at even number of applications to daily active addresses to daily volume. It's just not, you know, sort of where we are uh, compared to web 2.0. We're still very much an order of magnitude behind. I mean, this is just a very, very rough snapshot. This is not scientific by any means. But even if you look at, you know, sort of number of Coinbase users to number of global PayPal users, uh, you can see, you know, 20 million, around 20 million uh, Coinbase users, and this was polled about, you know, last year. Um, we we're looking at 254 million uh, PayPal users. Looking at sort of Brave browser downloads to active Chrome users, you're looking at something from 10 million to a billion uh, Chrome users. And, you know, even looking at chat, just as a snapshot, we have about 100,000 Riot Chat downloads on Android compared to 10 million on Slack. So we're pretty much an order of magnitude behind. And obviously, this is due to many reasons. Uh, everything from you know, the number of applications and use cases we have to uh, you know, sort of technical developments, scalability and so on, uh, regulatory uncertainty. But today we're gonna focus on one thing we could actually improve on while we you know, work on the, the other other things is the design of user experience. So I did this little experiment last year, and this has improved tremendously, even in the last 12 months. Um, but it took me about 40 steps for a newbie uh, who doesn't have any crypto or any setup to creating a CDP ma on Maker. 40 steps, that's a lot. And that's not even including the number of Googling you might have to do to figure out, you know, how do I create a wallet? What is a 12 receipt? I didn't count any of that, but it took me about 40 steps. So it's intimidating and not quite the, the future that we sort of imagined or wanted to create because if it takes 40 steps, that limits it to a very, very small subset of users who would be willing to go through that. So how can we make this easier? Here's a quick, quick survey of UX experiments and best practices that we found today. And we thought about doing this um, sort of in the three steps that it takes to onboard someone new to crypto into having crypto. So we're talking about creating a new wallet, step one. Number two, acquiring crypto. And number three, making a transaction. And this list is not exhaustive. I think this is an ongoing list that we want to rev on. But let's start with this, creating a new wallet. So the seed phrase experience is still extremely gnarly. I'm sure everyone in the, in the room has gone through this, creating a seed phrase and storing it. Yeah. Has anyone been fearful of losing it? Yeah, a few. You know, maybe losing it or getting it wet or, you know, it's, it's still pretty gnarly. Um, so how can we gamify the seed, ex the seed sort of uh, experience, right? Um, I do like what MetaMask 
has tried to do, which is they try to gamify it uh, in a way where in order to confirm your, your, the, the, the order of the words, you, you know, sort of play a little game um, and arrange it in a certain pattern to make that happen. So I think you can gamify it and make it a little less scary uh, for the users. Incremental ownership is another big idea. And what this means is, you know, sort of having the idea of nudging users to level up ownership versus having them um, go through the seed experience all at once. So what this means is if the wallet, say, has um, an amount that's just below a certain threshold, so maybe it's like a dollar or two dollars or even five, um, maybe you don't have to make them back up their, you know, back up their seed phrase straight away, um, ease them into it, have them enjoy the experience before um, making them go through that pro process. Um, universal logins is a great, great uh, design pattern that Alex Vanessan and, and uh, a few others in Austin Griffin have worked on. Um, I love this because they're talking about um, the idea of a seedless wallet with uh, social or multiple device uh, recovery. So the idea is that the wallet is a smart contract that forwards transactions to your behalf after verifying signatures. I think they have made huge progress on this, actually, if you look online on universal logins or meta transactions. Um, they have really great guides for onboarding flows um, that are portable across different apps. Definitely check that out. Um, Argent is a, a great expression of that. Um, Argent is a smart contract wallet. Um, and the, the metaphor they've used is that you can appoint guardians to protect your wallet or to uh, recover your wallet in any way. Um, and what this Guardian is, is that it can be anything from a person to another hardware wallet, um, um, but it's a really cool metaphor that feels very easy to use um, and, and comfortable for a lot of people. So definitely check out Argent. Um, if you want a, a demo, uh, sorry, to, uh, if you want um, access to this, just please let us know or, or reach out to Argent themselves. I think they are live on the App Store. So cool, let's talk about acquiring crypto for a second. So the first thing you kind of get met as, as a, as a first-time user is the KYC AML compliance flow, which is pretty scary. Um, I do like this example from Sum and Substance. I don't know if they're still around, but um, the idea is, you know, some of the best practices is use gradual verification flows. So only ask for the bare minimum as uh, the users on boarded. So you don't have to ask them for everything you need at one point if their transactions are below a certain amount. So I think if it's below 2,000 or 3,000, don't quote me on this, um, you don't need their uh, social security number. But so just make sure it's uh, tiered um, in terms of asking for identity uh, and be respectful of that. Um, earning crypto. I'm curious if anyone knows of any great ways to earn crypto. <laughs> well, earn in crypto. I think Gitcoin or Coinbase Earn is are the best examples right now. I think we had um, uh, what's that great freelance site Upwork that used to pay people in crypto, but I think they uh, now don't have that option. But you know, how might we get more sites to allow payments in crypto? That would be interesting. I heard a, an interesting example today about Italians for some reason um, paying in crypto on Bitcoin online more than Visa or Mas Mastercard or something like that or PayPal. It's kind of a weird uh, statistic, but definitely check that out. Um, and the last but not least, talking about making a transaction. So human readability. Um, this is an example of a wallet that is out there, um, designed by engineers, not designers. Please rope in your designer friends if possible. We love you guys, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, but this is a pretty good example of how uh, a screen like this is, you know, fairly machine readable, but not human readable. Um, and there are very, very easy ways to just make this a lot easier. So first, you know, consider something like ENS or um, an alternative like that where, you know, you can turn a, an, oops, oh, there you go, sorry. Where you can turn an app, is your computer? Close, maybe, dead or close down? Shouldn't. Oh, there you go, coming up again, fast forward. Perfect. Um, there are a couple of easy tricks you can do just to turn this into something a lot more readable like, like this, right? So first, uh, consider ENS as an easy user-friendly solution of turning your long list of numbers and letters into something very human readable. Always round up your transaction amounts to maybe I would say three decimal places 
it's just less mental calibration for a lot of it. So from this to this just looks a lot less scary. It's pretty simple. Um, abstract away gas. Uh, I mean, I think meta transactions have a pretty cool way of maybe allowing the, the product or service or the DAP to pay for, for gas on behalf of their users, which is a pretty neat uh, concept or trick. Um, but if not, you know, just be totally um, transparent about transaction fee. You know, I think MetaMask had this uh, rev pretty fairly recently where they talk about transaction speeds um, as well as your amount. So make sure your fee options communicate the speed or urgency, otherwise it's just a black box to your users. Um, I wanted to point out Wallet Connect as well, which is a very cool uh, API done by Pedro Gomez, who you know, sort of bridges the desktop browser and mobile wallet experience in a pretty seamless way. Notifications. So waiting for transactions to be confirmed is a pretty nerve-wracking process. Um, this is an example not from a crypto project, but from a travel project. But what I really love about what they did was that they um, showed up progressive reveal for notifications. So if you look at the first uh, notifications, it's just, you know, your ticket has been issued, but if you double click on it, it actually reveals a lot more information um, that uh, could be useful or interesting to the user. And I think what's interesting about that is that, you know, we often think, I mean, w working in the space, we actually have access to a lot more information that we can share with our users. But how do we not overwhelm them with them, with that, or even just abstract away so that they can't verify it for themselves. So this is a really nice way of just double tapping or allowing them to double tap into um, more information that they can access or they actually have access to. Cool, so that's you know pretty much a very, very quick snapshot of um, some best practices for the three major steps for a crypto newbie. Um, the good news is I think we're getting closer. Um, if you take sort of the, the examples, um, even in just this presentation, and apply it to the 40 steps that we had, it brings it down to, to under 10 clicks. And now that's a very, very powerful idea. Being able to access a whole suite of decentralized finance in under 10 clicks for someone who's never had crypto or never accessed crypto is a really powerful idea. And I think it gets us a lot closer to the you know, democratization of being able to access tools like that. So I'd hope. And here's my ask to all of you in the room who are working in this space. Number one, talk to your users. That's the number one thing that I think a lot of projects don't do. We think we understand our users, but when you actually talk to them or show them your project, you actually got get a lot of first-hand insights um, that you might not have expected. It is uncomfortable, don't get me wrong, it really is. Um, but I would suggest try to do that, even if it's three, even if it's five, even if it's 15. Collaborate with designers. Um, we are interesting people, unusual. Sometimes you might get frustrated, it's totally fine. We wear a lot of black, we're a little strange. Um, but definitely try to collaborate with designers and others. I think this space is actually a very, very collaborative space. You want to collaborate not with just engineers, you want to collaborate with um, uh, communicators, storytellers, designers, um, political scientists, economists, and all that stuff. So blockchain itself is a very, very multidisciplinary field uh, in a discipline itself. And last not, but not least, let's build a Web3 design system together. I think this space calls for not just one company or one protocol to define all the US, UX best, best practices. This is a very collaborative space, and I think this is something that will emerge across different projects as we see best practices or best examples that emerge from different projects or products that are working on this. Yeah, thank you. So turning it over to Dan right now, who can talk about. Yeah, so um, you know, once you've implemented all these great suggestions that Tara has, how do you know if you're actually moving the needle? Right, um, so measurement becomes really important. Um, we want to get closer to this. I'm, I'm not necessarily thinking we need to go this far yet, right? Um, but we we don't want to get stuck like bike shedding. That happens way too much um, in this space. Um, so let's talk about choosing the right metrics, right? You can optimize for anything, and if you don't choose the right metrics, you're going to optimize for the wrong things and not really build stuff that's going to be able to go mass market. 
Um, so everybody knows market cap is the most important metric, right? No, 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 no. no. We're not talking about market cap. Um, so the, the kind of general categories that I would encourage people to think about with this are really we're just like looking at usage, revenue. I know it's a foreign concept in this space, right? We all just, everyone just issues a token, the number goes up and everyone's happy. Um, there are some crypto specific metrics around like looking at on-chain metrics. Um, and then final, finally, you know, for some things you can look at kind of social and marketing and see how you're doing on that front. So kind of going through these. Um, for usage, this is stuff that's really, really well developed in kind of traditional Web2 apps. Um, so I would encourage you, for folks who have not kind of gone through the, the product creation process with like non-crypto apps, there's a lot of really great content out there that can help you think through what are the right metrics that aren't going to mislead. Um, and you know, all sorts of options here, um, but really be, be make sure you're drilling in, right? Some folks care, about, um, you know, are you looking at daily actives versus weekly actives versus monthly actives, right? If you are doing a lending product, you probably don't care about your daily active users because if you're lending people money, like they shouldn't be having to like check in with you on a daily basis. Um, for some things that are like, if you're a trading focused app or a game, you probably do want to look more at the, the daily or the, the weekly actives. Um, once we get into, uh, crypto, it gets a little weird, right? Because a lot of these things, when you're talking about some of the traditional like app installs, you've got at least the unique devices and it's a lot easier. When you're starting to look at things like wallets created, um, number of daily active addresses, things like that, they're all super gameable. Um, and so there's often um, some issues around that. So if you look at this list of like, uh, I think it was like DAP Radar, um, the the numbers here, it's like, these are the top ETH apps, and it's actually impressive that like there's not more gaming of this going on, because if you look at the the volume, the number of users, right, you can have 500 users per day and be in the top 10 dApps. Like, that's ridiculous, right? That shows how far we have to go um, if that's considered a relatively successful dApp. Um, the other thing that kind of gets a lot of attention here, and I should update this because the chart looks a lot better now than when I took the screenshot. Um, but uh, we, we look a lot in the DeFi space, especially so, so much lending and borrowing activity, and that tends to come around um, how, much, uh, how many assets are kind of locked up, what's the value in ETH and DAI and dollars. Um, and that, that often is a way to compare, uh, I think, one of the encouraging things that we're starting to see in the industry, I think, is people moving beyond just saying how much is locked in, but like how much is being borrowed. And then for something like Uniswap or Zero X, like it's not quite right. You really want to look more at transaction volume, but there are um, things that you can measure. Um, revenue, yay. Um, I've started to hear more and more folks talk about um, how they're going to introduce kind of a freemium model and start to, start to charge um, certain types of users for certain products. One thing that I think is, is a big problem here is a lot of people have really, really skewed ideas of the conversion rate they're going to get from free to paid. Um, so we're all familiar with all these companies, right? Like Spotify is off the charts insane in terms of how they convert from free to paid, um, but they've got music that everybody wants, so okay. Um, like Google Drive, like that's actually a, a you know half percent conversion rate from free to paid is is actually pretty good. It depends on the numbers you're looking at, but if you're look if you're projecting to do better than low single digits, you're probably being pretty unrealistic um, for most products, right? There are some that, that are going to be exceptions, but generally speaking, revenue is a great thing to track. Don't expect to to convert at really high rates. Um, and then social media marketing, right? This is not one that is maybe long term important, but sometimes early on in your product or protocol's life cycle, this can be one of the few things that you really can measure. Um, so thinking about things like number of followers, how much engagement you're getting on social, um, everyone sets up their own like you know Discord or Telegram group or things like that, and looking at the activity there. There's all sorts of ways that you can measure this. And again, I want to emphasize like, generally this isn't as exciting as some of the other things that show real usage, 
but it can be a proxy if your project isn't yet in a place where you could be reasonably expected to be showing real numbers. Um, that's it, and uh, we've got uh, a bit of time left, so we're, we're happy to, to take some questions and have a little bit of a discussion here. So the question was, how do you design um, for something that uh, speaks to both new users as well as more advanced users? Um, maybe I'm just inferring a little bit, but maybe you're talking about how much hand-holding do you need in an app? Um, well, I would say the best apps are, are simple to understand and easy to use, and they should speak across the spectrum. Um, I know that's a, that's a little broad in terms of the explanation, but I would say, you know, even if it's something like a simple tutorial, it doesn't have to be pedantic or overly hand-holding um, or, you know, condescending in any way. Even if it's, if it's, I think you can use a lot of language or metaphors to make it understandable for both the newbie user as well as the more advanced crypto user. I think there is, I think there is um, the time and space for more detailed information that you can either wrap in a blog post or in sort of notifications that are hidden. You know, like a little information button that's a little hidden. Yeah, I mean, not that I would hold them up as an example of doing everything around the product front, but you know, Coinbase does have their kind of Coinbase and then Coinbase Pro. Um, I think that's an example of you can have an interface that is for more advanced users and then one for more for new, more newbies. Um, and for folks who are designing protocols, that's one of the really cool things is that if you're building a protocol, you can then easily just build multiple interfaces, right? If you're if you're intending to build a protocol and it's not relatively easy to create multiple interfaces to tap into that protocol, then that's a sign that there's something bigger that's a problem going on there. Like a physical goods marketplace? Yeah. Um, Could you repeat the question for a bit? Yes, yeah, so the question was like, what, what would be the ideal interface for a marketplace? I think, uh, without, without getting more specific to what you're doing, it's, it's hard. I mean, it, it, all, I mean, even even getting more specific, we can't just like say, this is the right interface generally for your marketplace. Um, yeah, let's say, um, you know, if you're trying to build a housing, you know, you have this marketplace where it can go um, kind of cross platform and then like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I think it's it's much easier to like have a prototype to respond to than just abstract, yeah. Well, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point, is, is rather than start from scratch, build in order to learn, maybe start with something that is, hey, I don't know, something really cheap and fast that people will respond to. Absolutely, I think that's that's been the, the the we're seeing a lot of movement in the space. I think towards like rapid like prototyping and iteration, as opposed to we're going to do an ICO, raise a ton of money, spend years heads down building something we think people want, and then we find out either we can't build it or nobody wants it. Right? That's not <laughs> we've we've run that experiment. That is not the right way to build a product and build a company. Um, so yeah, I think you know. Getting, getting even paper prototypes in front of users early is really, really important because um, you, you need to get that feedback. Mm -hmm. I'm actually curious, and, and maybe we can turn this into more of a conversation into the room versus a Q&A. Um, but if you look at Web2, I mean, the example, I mean, the, I mean, companies are going even further and further ahead. You could basically have a landing page that sells fake products or products that don't exist 
already, right? But I guess in, in the blockchain and distributed web space, you kind of run into a little bit more, um, you know, I would say security concerns, right? You can't actually launch a protocol or, you know, whatever, a DeFi platform without making sure your smart contract is watertight, you know, you don't want to lose money, or you don't even making sure you're, you're not uh, stepping on any sort of gray areas of, or s stepping past the gray areas of regulation. Um, so I'm curious if anyone has any thoughts on how do you get stuff into market real fast in the space that maybe is equivalent to, to the Web2 space, where you, know, you could have a Kickstarter page that basically sells product and starts collecting revenue um, even before it hits. And actually, yeah, I think that's, that's a great question. The one thing I do want to call out is that we are writing, you know, generally speaking, in the space fiduciary code, right? You're dealing with people's money. And so it's really important not to like roll something out on mainnet, unaudited, and be like, we're iterating quickly, but like put some money in here, right? Yeah. Like you need to be very, very clear about like where you are. Um, one of the things I think, you know, to start point about what's available in kind of traditional Web2 space, one of our favorite things to do is just, you know, run, run, spend $100 and run some like Facebook ads um, and try, test out different messages and people to landing pages. Like that's a great way to get feedback whether there's actually something that people want there, and then you can go build it out. But like at least just see if there's like interest even in the concept and the way that you're positioning it. Any thoughts? Yeah, and I guess the equivalent would be running something on testnet or Rinkabee. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, sorry, I'm Matt from Block Native. Um, when we first started, one of the big ideas was do it on testnet so people could get used to it and play with funny money. And all of our data suggested people just don't care. That like literally you put them on testnet and they just don't engage because why engage? Because it doesn't mean anything. And then you flip them over the main net and it's the opposite. They super pay attention but there's high anxiety and lack of understanding and all sorts of problems. And so uh, it doesn't seem like there's much of a middle ground that's been established yet in the minds of users, at least as far as we have seen. So that's what we found. is the incentive, you know, being on testnet definitely dilutes that, so. <laughs> so like, I think Cosmos was one of the first big ones to do this uh, with like their game of stakes. Um, I love this that's becoming a trend is that, that different networks are rolling out incentivized testnets We're like, yeah, it's funny money, but if you do certain things, if you break things, or if you manage to accumulate a lot of the testnet coins, like we'll translate some of that over to mainnet. I think that's awesome. I want to see more of that because I think that does start to address some of the issues that you brought up. Like, right, if it's all funny money, nobody cares, but you don't want it to be high anxiety. You want people to screw around and try to break things. Yeah, I think the stakes are what matters. And one of the things we found is even you know, people with very high net worth, when they're moving five bucks around, they don't care. So it doesn't matter the dollar volume. What matters is real money moving around in similar situations with concerning incentives. That's what matters to me a lot. Republic, I think, uh, is coming up with um, adoption techniques where, you know, let's say you're about to invest in a company um, that is a blockchain product. Um, they structure some incentives so you can actually learn the onboarding steps of that platform. For example, like, you know, hey, read the white paper or take a look at this three minute video and you get, you know, five X coins. Um, and then, you know, the steps uh, further on go to like, you know, really just exploring the DAP and showing like little pieces and snippets. I think that was a good idea. Um. Yeah, th those are good. So sim sounds similar to like Coinbase Earn. Coinbase. Yeah, they do that too. Although one of the interesting things, like recently somebody just cleaned up, there was a whole bunch of um, like thousands of maker CDPs that were underwater, but nobody had bothered to liquidate them. And somebody looked into this and was like, oh, those were all the Coinbase Earn users who'd created like low value CDPs and they were just too small to be worth it. And then someone just went, kind of went in and cleaned up a few thousand of them. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's an interesting way, like give people a way to learn and onboard, but I think there's questionable evidence as to whether it actually 
leads to long-term use and engagement, but love it as an educational tool. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, maybe like we'll do this as like the kind of no shill zone, but are there, are there products that you guys have tried in this space, not your own, that you think are doing something really, really right um, when it comes to solving some of the, the usability challenges that Tara highlighted in terms of like kind of initial like seed phrase creation and like acquiring crypto or doing your first transaction? Abridged, Abridged yes. That's like they're, it, it, and it's like that's developer tools, right? To make it easy to pull that in, that gets some of the meta transaction stuff that Tara was talking about. Yeah, we we are big fans of abridged. Abridged, abridged dot io. Burner wallet. Burner wallet. Yeah, Austin Griffith. Love that guy. He's done amazing work. Is he here? Oh, okay. Yeah, burner, burner wallet, it's like really simple like in browser wallet. Um, you can export the, the keys after if you want to, but just like it's easy instantiated. Uh, I think the, the main version of burner wallet I think is using the XDAI um, sidechain um, proof of authority and it's um, just blazing fast way to, to like interact. You're actually doing it, well not on chain, on a side chain essentially, but um, gives people really a very, very quick hands-on experience. A lot of events have been using um, forks of burner wallet uh, to pay food trucks and stuff like that. You basically can get a QR code and have a wallet and money and then you just like that. Yeah. So pretty neat. Pretty neat idea. It's open source too, so you can use it. Right. Yeah. Bordis, yeah. Yep. Yep, they do good stuff. Thank you. So, um, how do you how do you see uh, these applications qualifying themselves in the future? You had talked about audit, getting an audit done. Um, like, do is that something that applications will do, or as a means of saying, "See, I I am trustable." Do you see that as do you see that as what people will do in the future, or is there something else they'll do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, I think already we're starting to see folks that have essentially protocol layer stuff. You, If you're writing smart contracts, A, everything has to be open source. B, you must get an audit or no one's going to yeah. no use it. Yeah. Or even if they do read source, have you really figured it out? Great point, yeah. So, so yes. Uh, so, I, I think, that, and that's, if you do have the ability to get deep technically, then audits can help because it can point out like where the potential weak spots are. But absolutely, I think one of the things that um, we've been looking for and have not seen something to invest in yet is something that is more on the kind of client side that is helping to protect the user and validate things. Wallets kind of act that way, but anyone who's used MetaMask or, or various wallets know like often you get these like you're just signing a transaction and you have no idea, like th there's no easy way to verify that it's doing what the interface tells you it's doing. Uh, so we need better tools if we're gonna actually get to the place where users are in control um, and that they can verify, not just trust. Um, we need better tools to, to help on the client side do that. Just to continue uh, with that question, um, in terms of establishing trust in an application or a platform, have there been any experiments that your team has done that basically tells that you know it's just like these three things that users are really looking for? Okay, experiments or traits that, that users are looking for. Um, yeah, so it was a question about you know what are the what are any experiments that, that we've run to see like how to build trust with users or uh, characteristics that we've seen evidence that users like and that helps them trust. Um, you want a response over there? Yeah. Uh, 
if you can maintain a, a vibrant community that can answer questions for new users, that's a definitely a big onboarding step is uh, having people be able to come in and ask questions in your Telegram, Discord, wherever that, that community might be uh, discussing things. And uh, if you're not a technical user, you can ask questions that you might have about how the application or protocol might work uh, to more technical users that can respond. And so that's um, not necessarily something that you can build uh, directly in code, but uh, you can build in spirit. Talking about kind of like the wisdom of the crowd and having an active community that, that basically can back you up. Binance Angels is actually an interesting um, analog to that. I think it's over, I don't know how many angels they have, like a thousand or something, but they're actually one of their most active customer support worlds. trying hard not to shill. One thing that we have found is gas is, is a super confusing concept. And the problem, of course, being that if you have zero ETH balance, you can't transact, even if you have no interest in doing anything in ETH. And some of our customers report 30% of their uh, fully onboarded users have zero balance and therefore can't transact. So that's a big hurdle to get over that will increase your effectiveness 30% off the gate, typically. Great point. Tara, earlier you were you mentioned um, you gave you a bit of advice to talk to users, and I think that's great advice. I wonder if you'd be willing to talk a little bit more about what that looks like, because I, I think well, a lot of people, um, when they hear that, they don't know exactly what that means and all the different techniques and tools there are for talking to users and why that's so so powerful. Yeah, great question. Um, so IDEO has this open source, actually. So go online. I think it's called designkit.org or something like that. But if you look at IDEO design kit or um, uh, something like that, is it user, user design, something like that. Yeah. It's open source. Actually, they give you a, a little set of tools um, and questions and frameworks for user interviews. So user interviews isn't a dark art. Um, what you do is that you know you sort of ident first identify the personas that you're you're looking at. So these are the types of users that you think will be using your apps. They can be um, sort of clustered in terms of um, user usage patterns. Maybe you're looking for someone who is an extreme user or someone who's uh, not a user. Um, you can you know sort of cluster them by geography, demographics, whatever you'd like um, expertise. And once you have these clusters, you want to you know, sort of recruit some users who fit these profiles and set them up for user interviews. We would suggest first um, your qualitative and quantitative ways to do it. Quantitative is you, know, you obviously set out like a bunch of surveys and you get you know, really great metrics maybe through your website or, or whatever. I would also suggest doing some qualitative interviews, which is recruit a good number of them um, and you know, sit, down, sit down with them for maybe half an hour or an hour and actually watch them go through your product. We've done this with a number of um, companies through something we do called product validation days, which are you know, sort of user interview sprints. Um, and through that half an hour, have them go through using your product. Try your very best not to chime in or to explain or to do anything like that. Just have them go through it. It's gonna be a little painful. We've seen projects go like, no, don't touch that. And we're like, Oh, you don't get it. Um, but I think that reveals a lot of the pain points that you see through your product process. Um, you know, and after they go through that, then talk to them about why they chose certain decisions or why they made, uh, sorry, why they made certain decisions and why they didn't. Um, and talk about why they started using your app or incentives or, or um, you know, sort of questions or um, anything that would motivate them um, to use your app more or what dismotivated them in some ways. Say, you know, definitely do that. That's a great process. But there are um, a few key tips or, or tools you could use. Everything from that, that, that product process that I talked about to asking the five whys to uncover motivation. So these are great ideal tools. Five whys means talking to them and asking them why five times in a non-annoying way. And you really kind of unearth a deeper motivation. Um, for your users. I have a question about your why. So when you say five why, are you asking the same question over again? Like, why did you do that? And then they give you an example, then you say, well, why did you do that? 
Like, is that what you mean by finalized? Yeah, I mean, it's a little, yeah, it will, I'll take a minute to just go through that. I mean, it's, it's more of a technique, mm -hmm. um, and it's not so much, uh, you know, sort of drilling down into why did you do that, why did you do that, but it's really trying to understand. So if I asked you, um, you know, why are you here at, at SF Blockchain Week? You give me an answer, and I can continue by asking, oh, why did you make that decision, or why did you choose that? And then you kind of give me something else, and it goes deeper. So it's not so much um, drilling down on a specific sort of moment, but more of a fundamental reason. quantitative and quantitative research is really important. We don't have to survey thousands of people to get that really deep information. You know, y as you said, it's maybe it's five, it's even 10 people. You're getting really, really deep information. Um, if quantitative goes very wide, it's still relatively narrow. Qualitative and, you know, face-to-face -face user research is, uh, is more narrow, but very, very, very deep and valuable because of that. Uh, a moment ago, somebody was talking about what does it look like um, when that user is, is um, getting tense just by moving $5 around, you're not gonna get that in, in survey information. That's the sort of thing you can only get by watching someone eyeball to eyeball. And, and it's really valuable to, to have that. Wonderful, great. Yeah. So I guess if there, you know, thank you so much for, for your time and being here and um, being huge champions yourself. Wait, one more. Well, thanks, and see you guys around.